I was just reflecting. What a lovely hymn. What a lovely song before that. I just, sorry, it just sort of blew me away. Uh, the second reading is taken from um, John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. <clears throat> Jesus anointed at Bethany. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor, and Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as the keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. We're doing a bit of a double act this morning. So Graham is now going to come and bring us uh, the word of the Lord. And uh, we look forward to what the Lord will say through him. So uh, come up, Graham, and we'll swap the, uh, the mic over. Morning. As being one who often participates in joining you on Zoom, and I know sometimes when you're on Zoom, you feel a bit sort of isolated, and especially when sometimes Zoom doesn't work or whatever. And we feel, at least I do, sometimes I feel a little bit neglected. So I just want to say a, a warm welcome to to those who are on Zoom, because, you know, we, all of us, whether we're here or, or in our own homes, we're one together. And I know at times it's easy to feel when you're elsewhere, that you're not part, but we are part, we are one. We're one in the Lord. And I just pray that God will bless us as we meet together, and especially when we fellowship together around his table. Now, do you mind, do you mind if I ask you a question? It's rather personal, so um, I hope you won't mind. I'm going to ask it anyway, but what it. When was the last time you told God you loved him? When was the last time you told the Lord that you loved him? Most Sunday mornings, we sing songs and hymns expressing our love for the Lord. And this morning is no exception. But do we really mean what we sing? Or do we just go through motions? In fact, what, what brought you here today? Was it a sense of duty? You feel a sense of obligation? A responsibility to the Lord for all that he has done for you? So is it possible to serve the Lord out of habit or duty rather than out of love? You 
You know, it's all about relationship. So here's another question for us to answer. How is our relationship with God? How would you, how would I characterize it? Do you love him? Truly love him? Is he the reason for all that you do? The way you work, relate, talk, spend your money and time? Is your love for him the reason you serve? Or maybe that's the reason you don't serve. Or maybe it's the reason your service seems is not fulfilling. Does, does service feel like extra work you don't have time for? Does your service seem very weighty, bogging you down, taking up precious time, money and energy you could well spend elsewhere? Do you feel overworked, strapped, spread thin? Have you, not, have you contemplated not serving anymore? It very well could be that you feel this way because you are serving for the wrong reasons. You know, when I was, when I was much younger and very involved with church and church commitments, it was a sense of duty that motivated me to the point that I became over-responsible and had the attitude of mind that said, you know, I've got to take on these extra responsibilities because I assumed the job would never get done otherwise. I owned what I was doing and it became very much what I felt I should do. And when I look back on my younger life, I don't think I ever asked the Lord if I was doing, doing what he wanted. It was, you know, and especially when people would come up to you and say, you know, we need, you need to do, we need you because we haven't got, you know, and, and then you feel overwhelmed. So is our motivation love or duty or both? Now we're talking about love this morning, but if I said to you we were talking about obedience, you'd be forgiven for thinking that sounds a bit boring. Well I am talking about obedience. Obedience out of love. Love means obedience. Now somehow the word obedience has come to have a negative connotation. But that's not true in the Bible. Conversely, in the Bible, obedience is the flip side of love. It's the expression of love. In several places, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. And what is his command? You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. So what does it mean to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? Well, firstly, we are to love God with our everything. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our might. There's no room for divided affections or allegiances. As Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. If indeed there is one God who stands supremely powerful and valuable, this demands a supreme and total loyalty from you and from me. A loyalty that starts with the heart. Our spiritual relationship with God begins from within and from the heart, flows with the springs of life, it says in Proverbs. And without one's will, desires, passions, affections, perceptions and thoughts rightly aligned, the life of love is impossible. Moses called Israel to know in your heart that God disciplines like a father, his son. And he urged God's people to lay it to your heart that there is no God besides Yahweh. 
and to ensure that God's words be on your heart, thus anticipating the miraculous heart work that the new covenant would realize in Jeremiah chapter 31. This is a new covenant, said the Lord, that I will make with the people of Israel after those days. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Now, along with our hearts, we're, we are called to love God with our soul. In the Bible, soul refers to one's whole being as a living person, which includes one's heart, but it's also so much more. For example, in Genesis chapter 2, we're told that God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living person, a living soul. So we are to love God with our passions, our hungers, perceptions, and thoughts. But we're also to love him with how we talk and with what we do with our hands and how we utilize our talents and how we react to challenges. Our entire being is to display that we love God. And we are to love God with all of our strength. This means all of our energy, all of our gifts, our talents and abilities. And in our use of these, we can either commit our energy to glorify ourselves or to glorify God. To love God with all our energy and with all our abilities and with all our talents and with all our spiritual gifts means serving the Lord and holding nothing back. We are to love God with all our abilities, with all our being, with all our strength. And this means that the call to love God is not only with our physical muscle, but with everything we have available for honoring God. And that includes family, our home, our possessions, our hobbies and interests and our time. Although each of these words, heart, soul, mind, strength, can be explored individually as how we love God, I think the collective meaning is the greater lesson. We are not to love God with only part of ourselves, but we are to measure every thought, emotion, feeling, word, and action in light of our desire to please and honor him. We are to pursue our love for him in every aspect of our daily life with all that we are. Loving God is costly. This brings me to our second reading from John chapter 12. Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha, points us to an extravagant or perhaps I could say reckless worship that is costly, it's active, it's personal, and yes, sometimes it's judged. We express our love of, for God by worshipping him in all that we do. Whenever we see Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha in scripture, we find her sitting at the feet of Jesus. This lady knew how to worship. She knew, when many others didn't, that Jesus was the long-awaited Christ. After all, he, he raised her brother from certain death. Her act in today's reading is so significant that in the parallel account in Matthew, Jesus told them, truly I tell you, whenever this gospel is preached in all the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And that's no less today. So what can we learn from Mary? Well, for a start, 
she shows us that it's that true worship is costly. Mary's perfume came from India and cost 300 denarii in her time, which would have been a year's worth of income. And even if Mary and Martha and Lazarus were from a wealthy family, that was still a pretty pricey gift. It cost something for Mary to worship Jesus. You know, Mary is not moved by logic or careful planning. Far from it. Instinctively, Mary is compelled to offer unparalleled praise to the one she believes to be the king of all. In an undistrained demonstration of affection, Mary gives her most costly treasure. True worship costs. Yet the cost is always worth it. For Mary, for you, and for me. After all, Jesus paid a great cost for us. For Mary, the joy of knowing Christ was far greater treasure than anything she could hold in her hands. Because, that, because Mary viewed Christ to be her most valuable possession. She was able to hold on loosely to all other earthly treasures. Mary willingly gave up of her time to sit at the feet of Jesus, listening to what he had to say. She spent time with Jesus, and time is precious. Nothing is too good for him. True worship, yes, it's costly, and it's also active. By this I mean it's going to involve our whole being. Mary anointed the feet of Jesus. The normal custom was to anoint the head of a guest of honour. Anointing someone's head showed great honour. But taking the role of a servant and cleaning, then even anointing someone's feet, well that showed great love, great devotion and great worship. Paul, writing to the Romans in, in, in chapter 12, says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. You know, we don't have to make sacrifices to God as they did in the Old Testament, because we are the sacrifice. True worship is costly, it's active, and it's personal. It's between you and God. This was Mary's way of showing love to Jesus. Martha, Mary's sister, worshipped through her service. Mary gave through her devotion. Each worshipped in her own personal way. Your worship may not, be, may not be someone else's worship. God may speak to your heart in a whole different way than he does to me or to someone else. You have to find your own connection to God, your own way of honouring him for what he has done for you. Now, you know, there was one person in, that, in this story who was very close to Jesus. In a, in a physical sense, that is. But it was very far from him in a relational sense. Judas looked good on the outside, but he was corrupt on the inside, opening himself to be used as a tool of the devil. And that brings us to our last quality of true worship, because unfortunately, Sometimes it will be judged. Judas judged Mary, stating that she could have spent that money on the poor. And John, in his writing, notes that Judas was a thief and didn't care one iota 
about the poor. The sad part is Judas could have been closer to Jesus than anyone. He saw all the miracles. He heard all the sermons. He was in church every time the doors were open. Yet he missed out on true worship. And instead he concentrated on judging others' worship. And yet Jesus refused to allow anyone to steal Mary's worship, commenting that perhaps without knowing it, Mary was helping prepare his body for death. Unbeknown to this dinner party, in less than a week, Jesus would go to the cross. You know, sometimes people will judge our worship. King David, for example, his wife, Michael, judged his dance before the Ark of the Covenant as, he as it was returned to Jerusalem. David danced passionately before the Lord. It was an act of reckless worship. In a different way, spending lavishly to show his love for the Lord. Michael told him that he'd made a fool out of himself. And his reply? I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. David, like Mary in today's story, had decided to abandon himself in worship, regardless of the effect on his reputation. After all, as scripture says, if God is for us, who can be against us? You know, sometimes in life, we have to decide, am I going to care more about what God thinks or what people think? Peter and the other disciples were forced into this question, and Peter replied for them and said, we must obey God rather than human beings. I know, I, you know I, I, wish, I wish you could have met Rex. Rex was a member of our previous church. And he came to know the Lord through Alpha. And I tell you, that man's life was changed, totally. And he never tired of telling you what a difference Jesus had made in his life. His joy was infectious. But you know, sadly, not everyone appreciated his enthusiasm. And on one case, one elderly member of the church, who should have known better, suggested to Rex that perhaps he should, he should tone it down a bit as he was embarrassing some members of the church. Well, I'm very pleased to say that Rex took no notice. Rex said his only regret was that he didn't give his heart to, to Jesus earlier in his life and he wasn't going to waste the time he had left by not sharing the joy of the Lord. So, live your life for an audience of one. Worship God first and foremost. The Christian pastor and writer A.W. Tozer wrote, for the Christian, Everything begins and ends with worship. Whatever interferes with one's personal worship of God needs to be properly dealt with and dismissed. Keep in mind that above all else, worship is an attitude, a state of mind, and a sustained act. It's not a physical attitude, but an inward act of the heart towards God. So, be extravagant. Be reckless in your worship. Let your worship be costly, active, personal, and yes, even if it's sometimes judged, and know that it's worth it to one of the one who died for you. The inner essence of worship is to know God truly, and then respond from the heart to that knowledge by valuing God, treasuring God, prizing God, 
enjoying God, being satisfied with God above all earthly things. And then that, that deep, restful, joyful satisfaction in God overflow in demonstrable acts of praise from the lips and demonstrable acts of love in serving others for the sake of Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, your own act in giving up your son for our salvation was very costly. Help us to honour you in return with everything we have, with every action and every thought. We are yours, and I pray we will, we will be wholly available to serve you and to serve you alone. In Jesus' name, amen.